So okay, while we're, um, I guess this is going to be lecture four. So we're going to, oops. Um, I'm going to change that. Uh, so before we sort of go into the material, uh, there has been one, um, I guess, hiccup by the registrar in that they scheduled the 105 lab at the same time as our lab on Mondays. And so, and that section actually is, again, the largest section of 105, just like ours. It's like 28 people or something. So there's definitely no way to fit both. Um, but there is a, they, they have, so we have a third lab section that was kind of already in the schedule, which was 8 to 10 p.m. on Wednesday, very popular uh, time. Um, and so we were avoiding that because nobody really signed up for that. We were moving everything kind of for a second slot to be uh, 6 to 9 on, on Tuesdays, as you know. Now, there is an opportunity to jump into 105's slot on Wednesday, which they, nobody signed up uh, in their class for, and that's this 3 to 6 p.m. on Wednesdays. So if this works for people, what we would do is we would potentially, uh, so we would kill the Monday section. We would have, still have Tuesday section and then have also add this Wednesday 3 to 6. Does that work or that doesn't work at all? So still, you don't have to, you don't have to come to, two, to both. You, you could, for example, just be in the Tuesday section. And then if you just want to come sometimes for office hours in, in the Wednesday section, that's fine. You don't have to be there for uh, all the sections. Um, just like we, we said for Monday, Tuesday, it would be one full three-hour section and then whatever you need to finish up. Um, so. Yes, so the, the idea is that yeah, Alberto will staff, he can staff two sections, but he can't do three. And so if we shift, if we kill Monday, he would then staff Tuesday and Wednesday sections. Um, so how about, I mean, I just put this as a question mark. If people have, I'd like to know by end of today, if people can send me mail, who has a problem with you know, these two sections, Tuesdays. So it's Tuesday, 6 to 9 p.m. This already exists. And then Wednesday, 3 to 6 p.m., this is new. Okay, and then Monday, um, 10 to 1 p.m., we'll kill that. Okay, so who has a problem with this kind of scenario, please let me know so we can try to figure something out. But this currently, so we're going to do a check on 105 as well. If they can move to their 3 to 6 p.m. on Wednesday, then we we'll keep ours. But I don't know if that's going to be possible. So we're going to try to make it so that the group who has less conflicts basically moves. So, but we don't know yet. OK, so um, let me know about that. But let's dive. We have a, a, quite a few things. So what we're going to do today is um, we're going to do sort of a little bit more of a BJT biasing. And then we're actually going to start looking at some of the single stage amplifier topologies just while small signal bipolar stuff is still fresh on your mind. And then if time permits, I'll, I'll kind of dive into the MOSFETs a little bit just to set the stage for uh, that type of analysis. But we're hopefully going to wrap up uh, bipolars today together with some amplifier examples. So has anybody looked at this last page um, here from uh, that I drew up last time? OK, no. OK, uh, that's fine. You, you'll have a similar fun event on, on the homework. But um, I thought it would just go through this third biasing scheme just because it's kind of the most stable of all. And the stability really comes from um, negative feedback. And in a sense that we, we mentioned that, you know, with increasing temperature, there was this thermal runaway issue that the leakage current from collector to base was increasing and then multiplying up. 
And so that, that was creating the instability. So in this case, if we try to sort of follow the same uh, line of thought, if temperature increases, IC increases. But then what happens is as IC increases, uh, the voltage at the emitter also increases simply because there's more current running through this resistor, so, so this voltage increases over here. Now, given that the b uh, base current doesn't change much, because sort of a divided down version, uh, and the biasing here is usually set in such a way that it's independent of the, of the base current, uh, this voltage, which is VB, doesn't change. So then that means that VBE actually drops, which means that I collector drops. So we have essentially a stabilization effect. Or whenever we see that you know, an initial increase in thing results in that same value dropping, that kind of tells us that negative feedback is in place. Okay? So, so this type of biasing scheme actually stabilizes the value of IC across all sorts of kind of perturbation conditions. Excuse me? So, VBE is 0 0.7 for sort of the purposes of analysis, right? But if I do small perturbations, right, then that value will definitely change in small quantities, right? And so I'm trying to see, and if it starts changing slowly in a direction where it's accelerating in terms of the change, right, then I have sort of a positive feedback. But in this case, obviously, um, VBE will sort of get squeezed a little bit just to counter the change in the IC, right? And that will be enough to stay, keep the IC kind of constant. Right? So, so that's why this scheme is sort of nice. But we'll, we're going to see in this particular configuration what's the cost of having this RE inside. But let's, let's go just through the biasing example uh, just to show you that there are some rules of thumb that you have to sort of adopt that are not exact math. And in fact, in this course, most of the time, we're not going to ask exact math from you, but actually some sort of rule of thumb or intuition analysis. So what we're asking here to do is we want to design these uh, resistors so that current flowing here, which is IC, uh, is one, one milliamp. And then we get the maximum swing at this node. The maximum swing means you know, whatever I'm putting in here as, as the source, this has some gain. I want to amplify that signal at the output. So this node V out will be changing between some norm, common mode value and the rail. And then on the other side, it, has to, it can come down such that it doesn't put this transistor uh, out of the forward active region, right? So if it starts pushing it into saturation, then we no longer have the right uh, gain in the, in the path, so we want to avoid that. So we want to bias these transistors to be able to maintain these properties. So the first thing that I'm going to say is that, well, because of the uh, beta of 100, my I, I base is how much? I have IC, I have beta. What's, what's the I base? Right, so it's like. 10 microamps, okay? Now, for me to have, so, so, this, so this is 10 microamps here, uh, I base. Now, for me to have, to be able, for me to easily calculate this voltage, I would like to have this current, let's call it I bias, in what relationship to I base? A lot bigger, that's right. So we want to have okay, I bias a lot bigger than I base. Um, so this is, I would say, hack number one, right? So we, we essentially need to assume something that is not really given in the problem, right? Um, and that's what electronic engineers sort of do, usually. So what is a lot in, you know, for us? Factor of 100 is really a lot, like maybe something smaller. Like we can do even a factor of 10, right? 10 is 10% errors. 
10% error will easily tolerate in electronics because mismatch sources, all these other things will be kind of on that order. So maybe we say that, you know, I bias equals at least 10 IB, right? And that's already, we know, 100 microamps. So if we know that now this current is 100 microamps and we have a five volt supply, what is RB1 plus RB2? Those are these two resistors, right? So when that current flows through these two resistors, it has to give me five volts. Right? So, so what's, what's that? So it's five volts divided by 100 microamps. So. 50k ohms, right? Okay, so now I know what's the total, the sum of these two. Now I need to figure out how, how to essentially break that bias voltage across VBE and the remainder of the RE. So I need to create, make another assumption. I need to sort of figure out what this VE voltage is, right? So I'm going to say, I want some voltage that is a small portion of the total 5 volts. And the reason for that is that this VE plus VCE gives me sort of my, my voltage over here. Right? And so when my output is minimum, I want to have still a margin of VCES plus VE. So I want this VE to be as low as possible, right? So um, I'm going to say, for example, half a volt. So VE, so let's say 0.5 volts. That's relatively small, 10% of the overall 5 volt headroom. So I'm not eating up a lot into my headroom at the output node. So this implies that RE is um, VE over IC. Um, I'm going to just, okay, let me be precise. IE, but approximately, because I'm talking about 100, uh, that's approximately uh, 5K ohms. Okay? Sorry, 500 ohms. So 0.5 volts over 100 microamps. So. 500 ohms. Ah. Oh. Also, it's not 100. It's 1 milliamp. OK. In reality, it's 1 point, um, you know, 001, because we've divided by emitter current is 1 milliamp plus 10 microamps. But we neglect these 10 microamps. So now we have RE. We have also that uh, VE is 0.5. So this voltage here is 0.5 volts. Okay. And now we can have the assumption of that a forward bias, uh, forward active region, VBE, is 0.7. So what is our VB? Yeah. VB is VE plus. VBE. And that's 0.5 volts plus 0.7 volts. It was 1.2. Okay. Now we have, we know what the sum of the two resistors is, and we know what voltage they should develop here from a 5 volt supply. We also know that IB is negligible compared to the bias current. So which formula can I apply to calculate VB? as a function of these two resistors in the supply. Voltage divider, right? So I have RB2 divided by RB1 plus RB2 times VCC. So from here, knowing the sum and all these values, I can calculate RB2, right? And that's something like 38k ohms. And then RB1 will be 12k ohms. Okay. 
So what, what is left to calculate is this RC. So given that I have IC, which is a DC value, right? I haven't yet looked at the excursions in IC, right? I want to position that common mode voltage. So if I just look at the output stage, right, it looks something like this, RC, VCC. So the minimum value of this voltage is, we said, set by VCS plus VE. So this is minimum. What is the maximum value? Yeah, maximum value is VCC, is max. And so if I have a sine wave at the output, let's say I'm doing some AC amplification here, right, from a small signal to the output, I have some common mode at the output. So I know that my max is VCC. I know that my min is VCES plus VE. So in this case, this is 0 0.5 plus 0 0.1, it's 0 0.6 volts. And then this is 5 volts. What should this value be? Can you repeat that? 2.8. How do you get that? It's right in the middle, that's right. So we, we essentially look at the average of VCC plus VCES plus VE over two. So this is our V common mode out. And that equals to 2.8 volts. Now that we have 2.8 volts here, for the case when our DC bias current is flowing, what is RC? So how did you get that? Divided by um, 1 milliamp equals 2.2 kilo ohms. That's right. OK? So we're done. What was the, the, the big thing? The big thing was these two assumptions we had to make. And um, you'll be making these assumptions about VE depending on sort of what RE you want to have there and what impact that will have on small signal gain and stuff like that. We're going to do that uh, next. But you sort of had to make these two assumptions. Otherwise, it would be very complicated for you to go by hand through all the derivations, um, all the sort of nodal analysis and stuff like that without you knowing which current to ignore and which not. Yes? It's a good value that's like 10% of the overall uh, uh, swing. So it's really negligible when I see like how much it affects my final output, right? If I, if I chose um, something like uh, uh, 0.1 volt, yes, I could have done that as well. Uh, it, I would be 5x better. But then I'm getting uh, RE is then uh, a lot uh, smaller, right? So then my stability in kind of the negative feedback. I have to change IC by more in order to suppress. So, you know, it's a rule of thumb. Uh, so this is what we covered sort of in previous lectures. If, uh, so the question is, what, why is VCS 0.1 volt? Um, if you remember, that's kind of the onset of the base collector junction starting to become forward biased. So you're saying, my base emitter junction is strongly forward biased when VBE is 0.7. And then I'm looking at you know, what's happening. When is the onset of that other junction base collector being really kind of noticeably forward biased, right? And that's kind of at 0.1 to 0.2 volts below that 0.7, right? And that's why we say that VCE is then about 0.1 to 0.2 volts, right? That's where all the other equations that we did about minority carriers, I start breaking it down because you get a flood of forward biased carriers from the base collector junction as well. Okay. Um, okay. So 
with this, we're going to start now looking at some of the, some of the stuff for the uh, small signals. So let's, um, let's extract small signals um, from this amplifier that we just did. Um, So we're going to do, this configuration is called um, common emitter. Now, I'll say that normally we're going to have here something that is called CE. And that CE is going to be really big. All right. I'll, we'll sh I'll show you later uh, kind of why, why that's important. Um, but so at AC, that will sort of ground the, the emitter point for small signals. So we, we call that configuration common emitter because the AC ground will be at the emitter stage. Um, so let's first take a look at uh, GM. So GM is our uh, current gain. Uh, anybody remembers what the formula is? IC over VT, that's correct. So we have IC, one milliamp. This is about 26 millivolts uh, thermal voltage. So um, this is about 38 milliamps per, vo per volt or 38 millisiemens. Okay. R pi. Yep. Is beta over GM. And just in order to avoid the math, because I have sort of the inverse of the 26, and this is 100, this is really about 2.6 kilo ohms. Okay. And then we have the output impedance or resistance. Okay, that's the early voltage over IC. And that is, again, um, early was 100 in this problem, so it's about 100 volts. Sorry, 100 kilo ohms. So actually, let's go to the next page. It's easier. OK, so now we have all three parameters that we need in order to do the gain calculation for the stage. So let's draw out the, the small signal model. So we have some VS source. And I'm going to add. Um, RS, which is sort of the source, because every real source has some feminine kind of resistance there. Um, and then we're going to have um, which pieces. So as I'm looking at the at this thing over here, I'm looking from this side, which resistors do I see? Yeah. So what I'm seeing RB1 in parallel with RB2 and then in parallel with R pi. So we're going to say this is RB1 in parallel with RB2. And then the reason why I can just, I can just put R pi here and ground here is that that CE resists. Um, so we had a bipolar with RE. And then we had a CE here that is really big. So almost at any frequency that I want to push through, this will be ground, right? Because 1 over omega CE will be 0, OK? So, so this means this is AC ground. And because this is like a small signal source, small perturbations, we're going to say that that's essentially um, AC ground. Because of that, R pi doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't see the RE, which is the, the emitter resistor. So on the other side, we have GM VBE, and VBE is here. And then what, we, what do we have uh, looking into the collector? We have R out, which is so from the transistor. And what, what else do we have? RC in parallel, right? So this will be V out. And there will be RC here. 
OK. So let's calculate sort of the gain uh, of this thing. So what we're looking for is AV, which is V out over VS. So how, how do we do go about doing that? Okay. The idea is to find VB first. Okay. So, and that will be what? Okay. So it will be a voltage divider of this over RS plus this same thing, right? Now, not just because I'm lazy, but also because I really don't want to drag all these equations along. And I also know what the numbers are, right? We calculated all these numbers uh, for the biasing. How can I simplify this uh, expression? Do I need to carry RB1 in parallel with RB2 in parallel with R pi? No. Yeah, RB1 and RB2 are tens of kilo ohms, and R pi is a few kilo ohms, right? So, so I can just keep this to be R pi over, and then I have RS plus R pi. Um, okay, and what is that? RS is kind of the output resistance thevenin of, of a source, it must be low. Like, because if it's like too big, then this is not really, you know. Um, so it definitely is not kilo ohms. So this is essentially just Vs. This is approximately one, right? And indeed, that's what I want. When I put something into the amplifier, I want most of it to get right where it needs to get amplified. Because if I lose too much voltage in making it across from the input to VBE, then I haven't done the right thing biasing the whole, the whole circuit, right? So I, I do want this scenario where most of the input voltage is transferred all the way to the transistor, right? Okay, so that's a, as a sanity check makes sense, good. So now, what is, what is the V out? So VBE times RO in parallel with RC. And now we can sort of plug in the, uh, this, so we get minus GM R not in parallel with RC times VS, right? So RAV is minus GM. Um, and then, okay, let's write it out. How can I simplify this? We, we know what R not is and what RC is. So what, what is this really? Yeah, so this is approximately minus GM RC, okay. And given our parameters, this, this is like minus 83 point something, so approximately like minus 84. So our gain is about 80, okay, in this case. That's a pretty good gain for um, a single stage. So this is kind of what was done with this CE being infinite. Now, let's take a look what happens if CE doesn't exist at all. So I, I do uh, have just RE there, and we're going to call this uh, uh, emitter uh, degeneration. Why degeneration, you'll see in a moment. Um, so this is no CE. So now what I'm going to do, knowing that you know we've already kicked out all these RB1s, RB2s, because they're just too big, right? So I don't want to go through the whole analysis again with these huge uh, expressions. So I'm going to use that knowledge to just draw like a really quick model. And what we have in it, knowing that RS is also really small, I'll just draw VS going directly into R pi. Now I have to take into account the RE because I'm no longer grounding, AC grounding that node. So then I have my 
GM VB. And now I'm also going to ignore R0 simply because I know it's much bigger than RC, so it doesn't really matter, right? So I'm just going to put RC here. Okay. Okay. So this is now our V out. And so let's see what happens. This is I base. And this is GMVBE, but it's also beta 0 IB. All right. Or my beta 0, remember, that's kind of the small signal ratio of IC to IB. Right? And it's approximately the same as beta F, as long as beta F doesn't really change with voltages and stuff like that, which is kind of idealized. Right. So we know beta 0. Um, and we know that this ratio has to be, let's say, 100 in our case, right? which was beta F. So let's take a look how, how do we analyze this. I can just write out, knowing this fact that this is beta 0 IB and this is IB, I can just write out the expression for my Vs, right? So it's IB times R pi, which is this voltage, plus, and then I look at the voltage across RE, which is now RE times what current? 1 plus beta 0. IB. Right. So look, this kind of effectively amplifies the input resistance, right? This RE now becomes, oops, so much more important simply because now if I take out IB, I have R pi plus RE times 1 plus beta 0. So this is significantly impacting how much of my input voltage gets dropped across the R pi, right? Because RE gets amplified by a beta factor. And so that's in these cases where we did kind of the RE sizing, if this is uh, big, then you get a, a big chunk that gets dropped across uh, the RE junction. Okay, so from here, we can sort of say that IB is VS over this increase input uh, resistance and then we can go and calculate what happens at the output so what is V out if I know IB I know this current over here right and that current is the only one passing through RC so what's the output Um, so it, there's, there's a minus, right, beta 0 IB times RC, right? And then here we can say that uh, it's minus beta 0 RC uh, VS over, ah, okay, let's do the next page. <laughs> um, so we can say that V out equals minus, minus beta 0 RC uh, IB, which is minus beta 0 RC times VS over, and then we have this uh, input impedance. So our AV is just minus beta 0 RC over R pi plus RE times 1 plus beta 0. Now we know there's, there's a relationship between beta and GM and R pi, right? So we can uh, cut that out. So we, if we take R pi out of the whole thing, what we get is GM RC over here. And then at the bottom, we get approximately 1 plus GM RE. Right. Okay. So does anybody remember what was this? was the gain of what? Yeah, so, so this was AV of common emitter uh, amplifier, right? So with resistive de degeneration in the emitter, we essentially kill that gain by this factor. Okay. So there's a price for negative feedback, essentially, at least 
as far as DC gain is concerned, right? At DC, this CE uh, capacitor doesn't exist, right? Even if I put like a really big value at DC, just at DC, it doesn't exist, right? So it, I have to take this degeneration into account. So my DC gain will always be kind of affected by this much. RC, okay, let's see. The question is why, is, why um, is RC bypassing the, which resistor? The emitter, so it's going from V out to ground. The V out. Oh, oh okay, so, so the question is why is this ground for the RC, right? right? So we're drawing a small signal model. So small signal model, you know, any, V, which is the small signal voltage, is dV uh, is kind of, okay, let's call it, is essentially a derivative of, or a delta in, in a real voltage value, right? So on one side of RC, we, we have just the V out, right? So we kept that. On the other one, we had VCC, which was a DC supply. So its delta is zero, right? And therefore, we can say that's AC ground, right? Or small signal ground. So we can lump all the grounds. Essentially, the morale is that there is no supply voltage in a small signal model. So if you see anything except ground in a small signal model, then that's not a small signal model, right? Okay. So here we always just have the ground. And you know, to us, this is small uh, signal ground. So thanks, yeah, I uh, hope that clarifies it. Okay, so, so this was our uh, resistive degener degeneration in the emitter. So let's take a look at some other topologies. Um, for example, we're gonna do common collector. Um, so we're gonna have VCC here. Um, I'm going to just draw these, but I'm going to say that they're really big. They're not really infinity, but for all intents and purposes here. Um, and then I'm going to have RE here. So in common uh, collector, that just means that my collector is tied to supply uh, or to DC voltage, and then so I'm getting my output at the emitter point. What's going on here? Okay. <laughs> Tool doesn't like me for some reason. Um, okay. Um, so this is gonna be. Uh, okay. Fun with the display. Okay, so this is VE, uh, or sorry, we're gonna label it as V out. Okay, and then of course our input is going to be through a cap that is also big, and then we're gonna have our source here. Okay, so let's take a look at this model. It should be pretty similar to the uh, degeneration model, right, because we do have RE. It's just now we're interested in that voltage because that's our output voltage. It's not the collector voltage. So we have Vs, and then again, it goes into R pi, then it goes into Re. We have this AC or small signal ground. Uh, we have Gm Vbe, and now here, um, I do have R out, but it's also shorted, right? Because um, this, this VC node is really shorted to ground, to, to this small signal ground, simply because collector is directly attached to the uh, output. Okay. My output now is here. So this is my V out.
Can you tell me what the gain is? So we're looking at AV. Okay, let's do it one step at a time. So what we have is Vs minus V out, that's VBE. So that is going to be um, R pi times I, I base. And then we have um, the V out is RE times what? What current? Yeah, 1 plus beta 0 IB. So from these two, I can essentially set it up so that um, I can express both, uh, I can figure out what uh, uh, the IB is. So V out. Um, Let's our pi, and then we have our V out equals R E so one plus beta zero um, times. And so from here, we can kind of rewrite that as um, well, let's re let's repeat it just for um, so I'll, I'll rewrite it uh, slightly differently as um, and then on the other side, if we group all V outs. Uh, you get GM plus 1 over R pi uh, plus 1 over RE. Okay. So when you do V out over VS, you get um, RE. And again, now we can sort of multiply up by, uh, by R, R pi and then get 1 plus beta 0. And then here we again get 1 plus beta 0 plus R pi over RE. Okay. And then we can write this up as if we multiply now by RE, we can get 1 plus beta 0 RE over R pi plus 1 plus beta 0 RE. And if you look at this expression, and you remember that how the input impedance was done for the uh, resistive degeneration stage, remember that our input impedance was, uh, resistance was something like this, right? And we knew that this factor comes from the VE simply because the two currents, which is IB and IC, which is beta zero IB, were kind of getting together. So this is really like a voltage divider, right? A resistive divider between um, this, which is the emitter, the effective emitter resistance, and the R pi, which is the transistor uh, resistance. So sort of by inspection, knowing that that's the, the, from uh, the effect of the, of the uh, emitter resistance, you can kind of figure out uh, that this will be the gain. Okay. But you once have to go through these kind of equations, and then, it's, then from this moment on, you probably should never just go and do this derivation. Just by inspection, do these kinds of things. Okay. 
So now, if you, if you know sort of uh, the values, what you can say here is that, um, okay, beta zero is much bigger than one, right? So um, you can approximate this as beta zero re over r pi plus beta zero re. And then if I divide down by, by uh, gm or r pi, I'm gonna get just gm re over one plus gm re. Now, this will be approximately one, right? Because GM RE is bigger than one. And, but note here that, you know, this is kind of, this, this piece is the same as we had already in this resistive uh, emitter degeneration. It's just that the top piece is just getting GM into RE, and that's why your uh, gain is GM RE and not GM RC. Okay, so let's do another, um, another one. Actually, before we go there, uh, let me show you just, we never really talked about um, the, I mentioned input and output impedances and things like that, but we never really talked about how to go about formally testing for what that is. So let's, let's do an example. Let's say this same configuration that we did, but I wanna know what is R in. So I have this small uh, model, signal model. Uh, GM VBE, that's beta zero IB, same deal. And now I want to know what is R in here. So what is the resistance looking into that node? So the procedure is that I look into the circuit, I apply uh, VT, which is test voltage, in this case, small signal voltage, and I look at what the test current is, and then I divide the two and I get my input resistance. But when I apply this test voltage, I want to uh, essentially kill all the voltages and all the voltage and current sources that I have in my circuit. They're independent, right? This one is not independent. It's controlled by some other variable, so I don't, I don't kill it. But any standalone voltage or current source, I have to eliminate. So voltage sources I short, current sources I keep open, right? And so here, um, this is kind of the, the scenario we have. And then I can just calculate what IT is. So well, IT is the same as the base, right? And now I know that this voltage here is um, R pi times IB. And this voltage here is what? We did that, that just a moment ago. It's RE times what? One plus beta zero, right? So this magnification thing. Um, so my VT is this. And then I know that this is I test, right? So my R in is VT over IT, and that's R pi plus RE times one plus beta zero, okay? And now let's do the R out just for completeness. So in R out, I'm going to, I have R pi, I have my beta zero IB, and now, I'm applying a test source at the output. So here is my VT. And then I measure this current IT. And I'm looking for this. This is my R out. Notice that now I've grounded. So there was an independent source here, right? That was my VS in my original circuit, that's the stimulus, right? But I'm grounding that one. And so R pi is now tied to this uh, AC ground. So now I can, I can write up, um, say R out is VT over IT. And so let's see what that is. If I just look at the K, K, KCL on this node, I have that IT 
plus IB plus beta zero IB. So all these three currents are flowing into this node and that's V test over RE. That's the current that flows through the emitter resistor. I also know another thing, and that's that uh, VT is also directly across R pi. All right. So VT is actually minus IB times R pi. So I can plug that uh, over here to replace the value for IB. And so I get IT plus 1 plus beta 0, and IB is minus VT over R pi equals VT over RE. So I can now write IT as um, VT times the conductance, and the conductance will be 1 over RE plus this term over here. And I can write it as R pi divided by 1 plus beta 0. The reason why I'm writing it this way, it's easier to do conductances than to do the, all the ratios. So what is this connection of transistors? when I'm summing two conductances. Serious or parallel? Parallel. parallel, okay. Because if in serious, I'm summing resistances, right? But in, in parallel, I'm summing conductances. So these are conductances. So this is the same as IT equals VT over RE um, in parallel with r pi over 1 plus beta 0. And from here, I can write my r out to be just r e in parallel with r pi or 1 plus beta 0. And it sort of makes sense if you look at this picture, right? So I'm applying i test here. Whatever current gets through this guy, OK? I know that almost beta zero less current, or one plus beta zero less current, goes through this guy over here. But this guy is in parallel with my RE. So effectively, it's like this impedance is one plus beta zero less. It's not the same current flows through both, right? And because of that, it's kind of RE being in parallel with one plus beta zero smaller value than R pi. OK. So this sort of covers the input-output stages and things like that um, and of the most common BJT one, uh, one transistor amplifiers. We're going to sort of look at the MOSFETs next time, hopefully go, go through the basic kind of uh, MOS cap and uh, regimes, and then start looking at small signal models. OK. Whenever it's not specified and you need to calculate it, you can do all these, all these things. So if you, if you, for example, assumed, you know, VE of 4.5 volts, then that's not really working toward the max swing constraint that I said, right? But if you say I'm assuming something that is a small percentage of the overall headroom at the output, then I'm saying, okay, that's a fine assumption, you know. So whether you picked 0.1 or 0.5, that's okay. Uh, but if it's more, then it starts eating into pretty seriously into the available swing that you have. Then it's no longer the max swing solution, right? Yeah. Okay. I'll have office hours after lecture if people are curious about some stuff, so we can go over. Thank you.